Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to one of our conversations on Europe. Uh, my name is Anna Gshmabusa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And it is my great pleasure today to welcome Igor Gordoncic, who is the first of the EUI postdoctoral fellows here at the Department of Political Science and the Center for European Studies. Um, Igor received his PhD in 2009 from the European University Institute in Social and Political Sciences, and he has a CV that's lengthier than you know, some senior, senior professors, because he previously also studied at the London School of Economics, the University of Ljubljana, and the Universities of Trieste and Beirut. He has extensive experience in the issues of European Union accession and social policy, um, both as a scholar and as a practitioner with the European Commission, the International Labour Office, and others. His research focuses on the political economy of reforms in Central, East, and Southeast Europe, as well as post-socialist and pan-European social policy. And his book on this topic, uh, Pension Reforms in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe, From Post-Socialist Transition to Global Financial Crisis, um, will be published um, this year by Rutledge. Um, I understand there's a movie version coming out you know, in two or three years with Brad Pitt playing the role of pension reform. Um, <laughs> So we are delighted to have him here, and please join me in welcoming. <laughs> please join me in welcoming him as he presents his new research on pension policy in Central um, and, East, and Eastern Europe reforms and reversals. Welcome. Okay. Thanks a lot for this fantastic introduction, and uh, yeah, it, it's going to be Johnny Depp, though. Uh, oh, Johnny sorry, Depp. Yeah. No, in any case. So I'll uh, I'll present you today this. Uh, it's a little uh, uh, extract, basically, from uh, from my thesis, and uh, it's an overview of uh, of these pension policy developments in Central and Eastern Europe uh, since uh, since the collapse of socialism till basically the present day. And it's entitled "Reforms and Reversals." Basically, it could be also titled uh, "The Rise and Fall of Privatization in Eastern Europe." And so, I hope I hope I will make myself uh, clear how how this whole uh, thing, how this whole uh, neoliberal idea get, uh, uh, got uh, entrenched in Eastern Europe and why it now actually got also dismissed. So uh, the structure of the presentation is going to be uh, divided into four parts, basically. The first part, I will, uh, I will uh, um, uh, explain what is this new pension orthodoxy, what is the World Bank's role in promoting uh, privatization uh, across the world. Uh, what was the what were the criticisms to this uh, uh, policy, and uh, some reassessment of it. In the second part, uh, I'll uh, try to uh, show you what is the history actually of pension pri pri privatization in Central and Eastern Europe, the diffusion of it, and the variation in poli in policies that have been adopted in the past twenty years. And then the third part will instead um, focus on more recent events, so the financial crisis. And the fact that the Europe, European countries, have a bit of a peculiarity. The financial crisis can be seen as a dual exogenous shock. On the one hand, the impact of the crisis as such. On the other hand, the impact of European accounting rules, and in particular, of the stability and growth pact on these pensions. And finally, I will talk about reform reverses. The fourth part, instead, it's more uh, political scientist uh, stuff. Uh, we'll see if we have enough time to talk about it. Otherwise, uh, is uh, um, some uh, some thoughts about the political sustainability of reforms in uh, four selected countries: Croatia, Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia. So, let me start with the with the presentation. Um, first of all, the whole uh, the whole uh, um, privatization idea started back in 1981. This is with uh, the Chilean reform uh, that's under Pinochet with Jose Piñera as, uh, as Minister of Labor. Chile was the first country that totally privatized its pension system back then. Back then, however, it was thought that only a dictatorial regime, so an, uh, a totalitarian regime, could be able to do that, and that's incompatible with democracy and so on. However, however, the rise of, uh, the rise of neoliberal ideas uh, throughout the world in the 80s and, in, and their height in the 90s prompted and the Argentine and the Argentina reform under more democratic conditions in 1993, prompted the World Bank, and here I mean uh, Estelle James and Louise Fox, uh, so-called California girls, to write a famous book called Averting the Old Age Crisis, which has basically uh, laid down the foundations for the World Bank's blueprint of what the perfect pension reform should look like. And the perfect pension, the perfect pension reform should look like 
this, as you can see it here. So a change from a monopillar pay-as-you-go structure, which was the one favored around the world since the Second World War, meaning that there is one single uh, pension provision which is public and which is pay-as-you-go. Therefore, workers pay in at at time zero, let's say, and this money is automatically dispersed to pensioners at the same time. So there is no funding, there is no accumulation of wealth, no savings, no equity, no nothing. Instead, the World Bank decided that this is, uh, uh, this is not uh, diversifying risk, and secondly, that it is not the, uh, um, basically exploiting the potential of the financial markets, which have been historically, as we all know by now, outperformed all the GDP growth all the time, right? So it came up with a, a three-tiered or three-pillar structure, which you can see here. So a small tax finance, still pay-as-you-go, uh, usually minimum flat or means-tested uh, first pillar here to the left. Then the, the real hobby horse of the bank, a mandatory second fully funded entirely privately managed second pillar. And then whatever comes next, the occupational or individual voluntary pensions that can be in any case uh, added to basically in any kind of system we have, okay? So this was the World Bank's master plan. What were the uh, World Bank's, uh, mm, let's call them first order impacts of this uh, of these reforms. First of all, the World Bank said this, uh, the investment in equity will definitely outperform the, uh, the internal rate of return of traditional pay as go systems in the first place. And secondly, all this demographic, uh, the demographic structure, which has uh, so much degenerated in the last uh, uh, 50 years, uh, will be in any case solved through some advanced fundings. As we can see, these are two uh, famous studies from Genacopoulos et al. from 1998 and a, a proper World Bank veteran, Nicholas Barr, in 2002, uh, followed also by Stiglitz and many others, have actually disproved both of these claims so that the first order impact is nil. The first one is that if we, um, if we think of uh, um, uh, creating a funded pillar uh, out of um, pay as you go pillar, it means that we have to divert a number of contributions from the public, that is from current pensioners, into a savings account. Okay? But those current pensioners cannot just starve to death, so we have to pay for them somehow. There are three ways of paying, that is, uh, uh, don't remember what's the name of the triangle, but there are three ways of paying this for this. One is uh, uh, and usually this is divided through generations. You can pay, you can, it can be through savings on current pensions, that is current pensioners are paying, reducing indexation or whatever. It can be through the rising taxes or social security contributions to workers, so the current generation of workers will be paying for this. Or finally, it can be by issuing debt. So the only of these three generations who doesn't actually vote, so th that is the future generation paying for the whole thing, okay? So if we take account of this cost and we discount, Genacopoulos shows that the returns in terms of, of these privatized funds cannot be higher of a normal pay-as-you-go system. Second, bar, and I'm not going to enter the details, shows that both for a pay-as-you-go system and for a funded system, demographic challenges remain and they are not being solved simply because the underlying problems is nothing has nothing to do with the design itself of the pension system but it has to do with the fact that the production of a current cohort of workers is not sufficient to uh, be consumed by both the workers and the pensioners at the same time the second order impacts which were also uh, heralded by the world bank uh, were are also very dubious i mean we're talking about world bank saying that with pension funds, we will deepen capital markets, that is probably true. There will be more saving, more investment, and therefore more growth. But uh, none of these three, let's say, uh, quite complex chains, chain reactions is actually ha has actually ever been proven. Second, it is 
uh, the World Bank also said that uh, the labor supply will be increased and that uh, people will magically start uh, avoiding evading uh, social security contributions and taxes and will just emerge from the informal economy. Well, if you think about a, a contribution of 10%, that is a little bit of an optimistic uh, view. Finally, we have additionally, we have that uh, the World Bank also uh, said that probably the competition between funds will, will be such that administrative costs will fall and therefore we'll have quite high returns of these funds, which has been disproved in practice in most of the countries where a second pillar has been um, introduced. And finally, and here there might be some truth, effectively, uh, through these uh, funded pensions, we can channel our capital into those countries which have a demographic structure which is better than ours. At the same time, instead of importing uh, labor to somehow uh, compensate for our demographic problems. Now, the criticisms came also from the politics side. First of all, this is an evaluation of 12 years of World Bank's policies by the independent evaluation group within the World Bank, which says that the World Bank has not addressed sufficiently the primary goals of the pension system, so poverty alleviation and income maintenance within a fiscal constraints of constraint, of course, and that it has not focused sufficiently its attention on the income on the elderly. That means, of course, if we start, if we start uh, cutting current benefits or future benefits too much, um, we have that there might be uh, substantial backlashes of the, of the losers of reforms. There are innumerable cases of governments that have failed and fell because of pension reforms. I might just uh, uh, re remind you of uh, Berlusconi in 1995, or uh, uh, I think it was Juppé 1994 or three. Uh, and uh, uh, and recently, for example, the Pajor government in Slovenia in 2011, and so on, and so forth. The other thing is that um, by by saying that contributions will uh, flow from the state to the private sector, um, the policymakers simply implied that the grabbing hand of the state will be somehow uh, somehow prevented from grabbing actually these funds. Right. However, we have. It is also interesting to remind that private funds accumulate accumulate savings for as much as 40 or 50 years. And therefore, the honeypot for politicians to put their hands in is much bigger than uh, a normal pay as go system, which accumulates basically nothing. In fact, as we will see also later, in countries such as Argentina and Hungary, if these funds have been used as quick budget fixes, so the Kirchner reform and the Orban reforms, 2008 and 2010, 11, and basically these funds have been raided and renationalized. Okay. Finally, one of the things that is particularly relevant for Europe is that is the transition costs that I that I actually mentioned uh, already before. When you privatize a pension system, you have to at the same time pay those current pensioners that are uh, that. Uh, have seen these contributions diverted. Otherwise, otherwise, uh, we so the, the the government actually has to incur the certain deficits to, uh, to 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 top up these costs. Um, the this is taken now from Casey and Shimonovitz. It's a paper coming out uh, uh, soonish, I guess, and it's uh, and I added some stuff. Is that there are basically four views with respect to this. Um, we have the supporters of pension reforms on the one side and, the oppo and those who oppose it. On the other side, we have those who are, uh, who are for, uh, mm, so who are against penalizing these reformers, and those who are instead, who want, who want that the costs of these reforms are fully taken into account. This is very relevant with respect to the stability and growth pact, as I will show you later. How the accounting of these transition costs is being uh, um, is being actually taken into account, let's say. And we have that, of course, the supporters of for privatization and those who would like to deduct transition costs from current accounts are, of course, Central and Eastern European governments. On the other hand, we have for supporters of privatization who instead are for fiscal rigor and the f and 
for these countries to bear the consequences of their action. I mean, the hard guys, the tough guys, for example, the World Bank. On the other hand, we have the IMF, which interestingly at the beginning was supporting privatization, but it's explicitly because of these transition costs. It actually we do the support over time. So now it's rather leaning against it. If uh, if the fiscal standing of a, of a country is, is some insufficiently sound to have such a reform. And finally, we have a number of academics who, and I think many of them are uh, affiliated to the, to, to the ILO, uh, where they do oppose privatization as such, but they say, okay, if a country has started this reform, then there should, should not be penalized vis-a-vis -vis other countries which have not started such a reform, okay? And we'll see that this has borne uh, uh, extreme importance in the events uh, during 2010 and 2011. Now, let's go to part two. How, did, how does privatization fare around the world? So this is a nice map of the, of the Federation of International uh, Pension, what are they? Uh, administrators of pension. Uh, who are based in Chile, and so they are extremely happy to uh, to uh, advertise privatization around the world. And we can see, okay, they lost Argentina, they will lo lose Hungary. Uh, they are updating this every year. Uh, and we can see that the, the, the two regions in the world where privatization has spread the most are effectively Latin America and Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, an amazing amount of countries have taken this uh, on board. So, and now I'm trying, to, I'm going to try to explain why. So, first of all, let me uh, explain you how a socialist, uh, socialist uh, um, pension system did uh, uh, work and what happened with them uh, during the transition from, let's say, from socialism to democracy, from central planning to a market economy. So, first of all, these uh, systems consisted of three fundamental layers. There was a Bismarckian core. Most of these systems have been created already before the Second World War, for example. Bismarckian core means that the systems are intrinsically bound to having an employment relationship. So you have an employment relationship, you pay social security contributions that are based on your employment record, and then you get benefits which are at least somehow reflecting this thing. I'm not entering into details. However, many people uh, s m tried to depict socialist systems as universal, so independent from the from this relationship, from the employment relationship. However, when a system, as the socialists, had constitutionally guaranteed right of employment, so full employment by fiat, then of course these systems are somewhere in between. However, they can be still seen as Bismarckian. Then there's a second layer, which is post-war socialist, social, post socialist social solidarity layer. This is all by Thomas Inglot, a quite a nice book, where, first of all, socialist countries adopted as the rest of the world, basically, a pay-as-you-go system, so a monopillar, and had some sort of uh, reinforced stratification. So although, although the, um, let's say, the, um, the way socialist countries rewarded uh, wages, rewarded uh, workers, was based not so much on the concept of desert, but on the concept of need. So uh, wage equality was uh, compressed, uh, so wage equality was high, and, and so on. There were certain categories, those which were uh, important for the advancement of socialism, that were uh, granted lots of privileges. And we're talking here about minors, teachers, ballerinas, and so on and so forth. Then uh, we have also the third layer, which was the imported Stalinist centralization. This means that uh, there is, was not any longer a um, role played for subsidiary institutions, such as charities and so on. There was a monolithic public administration has been put in place uh, running the whole show there. We had that uh, these uh, systems have actually entered into a, uh, into a uh, harsh crisis already under socialism. First of all, there were financial strains. So this, this, uh, these uh, systems were uh, excessively generous in the first place. Retirement age uh, was extremely low. So 55, 50, that was the norm. 
uh, and assim assimilated periods excessively long. We're talking about some six years, up to six years of maternity leave, all paid in Poland, for example. Uh, and these were, uh, I mean, socialist countries actually managed to show off vis-a-vis -vis the West with this, uh, saying, yeah, look at our workers, they don't have to work, basically, right? So they just retire, that's it. So the other thing was that benefits were calculated uh, uh, according to best or last year formula, which means that sometimes, like, like a prime example is hunger, which still does it, by the way, your last pension could be higher than your last salary, which is kind of amusing, I guess, since you're not working any longer. And finally, there was a cross-subsidization of various other budget expenditure items, such as social assistance and whatever, which make, made these systems totally obscure. One of the important things in which is always demanded, demanded in, the, in traditional Bismarck systems, also in the West, is to make these systems clear. So social security contributions have to go, have to be used to pay for old age pension or whatever pension that they are meant for, disability and so on. Okay? This was not the case under socialism. And finally, although they were overspending, these systems were not guaranteeing uh, poverty alleviation because there was at least the so-called old portfolio problem. That means since prices were not an ideologically acceptable means of, uh, of determining the relationship between supply and demand, or, or better, scarcity was not reflected by their prices, simply inflation was not something that was taken officially into account. And therefore, most benefits were not directly indexed to inflation. Hence, if you were, if you started with a pension in your 50s and you were 80, it, the probability is that your pension was totally worthless at the at the time of before you die it were very high. Okay, so as many as 40 percent of people in Poland were actually working during their retirement, although there were some uh, restrictions to that. The crisis during that so okay, this was like the long-term development of uh, of crisis and the transformation simply. Uh, triggered the detonation. So first of all, we have a demographic emergency. I don't have now here the figures, but yes, the whole region uh, is has one of the lowest total fertility rates at the moment. And so it's aging very fast and the, and the future generation of workers uh, will shrink substantially with respect to uh, the pensioners. <coughs> then we have this uh, nice phrase by Peter Van Huysen, the, that uh, explains these uh, great abnormal pensioner booms. That means that is the most expensive way to deal with redundant workers. So you retire them. That's the that's as simple as that. Instead of trying to redeploy them, if we if we look at Shino, Shimonovic, uh, uh, for example, he says, well, thirty percent of the workforce. Uh, what happened with 30% of the workers force that disappeared mm -hmm. after 1989? Well, 10% was simply redundant. So unable uh, to, wor to work and, uh, and old enough to be retired. Gone, 10%. 10% was not old enough, unemployment, from zero to 10%, more or less. And another 10% just entered the informal economy. Therefore, no contributions. So this comes to the third point. So we have a multiplication of contributors, which took some time, although, although Soviet authorities are were renowned for, for being kind of, uh, uh, let's say, trained in, uh, in doing their job quite correctly. Like, uh, so mm, they, were not, uh, they were not taken totally aback when, when the number of contributors exploded in uh, Central East Europe. However, at the beginning, at least, this was a bit of a problem. And uh, output declined. We have that uh, minimally in Poland, dramatically in other countries, like 40% in the Ukraine, stuff like that, uh, with the transformation and recessions. And tax evasion became widespread in the whole region. And finally, uh, this, of course, means that the revenues to finance these systems were not enough. So it's slowly the revenues were falling uh, uh, um, falling behind what the what the expensive expenses were and finally we had that the political thing the political exploitation of losers of uh, uh, of these reforms uh, 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 of these reforms of the transformation recessions uh, was uh, continued unabated therefore with uh, lower indexation than planned and so on so we're talking about uh, uh, 
about disorganized losers, right? Whereas the pampering, the very expensive pampering of organized winners, lobby groups, uh, whatever constituencies that were there uh, to be pampered, uh, were, uh, were not discontinued and represented at high cost. So, in this uh, fantastic situation, we have that free reform strategies have been, um, uh, have been uh, um, tried. And as you can see, I'm not talking here, uh, I, heard, I overheard before some talking about uh, the role of the, uh, of the international financial institutions and so on. It was more a domestic fact. There were, there were definitely some domestic ideas and some domestic factors have been very prominent in these reforms here. So first of all, refinancing has been tried basically everywhere. That means that there was a rapid increase already during socialism in social security contributions. Social security, so tw for 25% in 1981, for Poland 38% in 87, and then incredible 45% in 1990. One has to say, I mean, there's a caveat, uh, uh, contribution rates are extremely difficult to compare across countries. This is not 45% of gross wages. And anything that is even in the US, uh, whatever it, they tell you that is the con actual contribution rates, that not exactly on gross wages. One should start on it, standardize it first, but we can talk about it. In any case, this has been discontinued because of basically too high non-wage labor costs, which were uh, impairing the international competitiveness of this. So it couldn't go much, uh, much higher than this, right? The second was retrenchment. Retrenchment, so cutting current benefits. So there was a lot of arbitrary freezing of indexation of all but minimum benefits. So basically they, in Hungary, but almost everywhere, they just decided to uh, stop indexation at a time of high inflation. That means that current benefits were actually losing out uh, uh, quite substantially. But most of these, uh, most of these measures that, man that happened in the mid-90s were struck down by constitutional courts. The constitutional courts in this country started to play, uh, let's say, defender of last resort um, role for the population, which could not appeal to the trade unions, could not appeal to the mm, political parties, and actually, through uh, various means, went to the constitutional courts, which declared that there is no transformational emergency any longer, because it has been it has passed since five years now, and that therefore these arbitrary measures has to st have to stop, and that rather try with systemic reforms, and that is when restructuring. Um, so that is when the ideas of the World Bank just were spot on. So it was in 1994 this book came out, and it was very eagerly embraced by uh, most of the countries we are talking about. So. And restructuring was very palatable for these reformers for at least three reasons. First of all, it is politically superior to both refinancing and retrenchment because it allows for very interesting quid pro quos with the so-called pro-welfare coalition. Pro-welfare coalition being the bureaucracy, the trade unions, pension associations, and so on. Second is it resonates with the public. The public was uh, to convince that they will all become rich through, through private pension funds on the one hand. And second, we have to, that as a reaction to socialism, equity was not seen any longer as the redistribution. Uh, but rather, equity was, uh, the term was, uh, was um, conceived as greater individualization in these kinds, because redistribution under socialism was unfair, and therefore the, the exact reaction was, let's individualize benefits, let's have individual account, individual and private accounts, okay? And finally, it is that there's so much attention is being placed onto the creation of a second pillar, so much propaganda, so much everything, and so much involvement then of the of financial organization that you can actually obfuscate cuts in the public, in public pension. And this has happened in most countries. Uh, in Poland, for example, uh, where they introduced a very progressive, just a very good, uh, I mean, still, I think, a very good uh, reform in a certain sense, have introduced, however, an extremely strict organization, so-called no notional defined contributions in, uh, in the public pillar. And this has been also rendered possible by the fact that a substantial chunk of, 
of contributions have been di diverted to the private uh, to the private funds. Okay. Now, uh, and for example, interestingly, that this was not something, uh, not only something uh, um, instrumental. Sometimes uh, uh, it was properly deliberate. In Hungary, for example, privatization has been used by reformers during their, mm, let's say, advertising campaign to denigrate the public pillar. They were saying the public pillar is dead. Now we are privatizing. So that's that's what is going to happen. Therefore, we have lots of countries embarking on this uh, on this uh, on this nice uh, privatization experiment we have different types of uh, privatization uh, substitutive that means that the public pillar is wiped out and entirely substituted with uh, private funds you will ask yourself why kosovo why the poorest country in uh, why the poorest country in europe is taking all of his workers contributions and sending them to london Every to Mary Lynch or somewhere every every month to and get them back and why they don't have a pay as you go system. Also, considering that the Yugoslav records were extremely good if compared, US or Yugoslav employment records were extremely good if compared to the rest of Central and Eastern Europe. Well, the, well, this is a bit of an accident. This was in 1999. Actually, one of these uh, NATO strikers has hit with their with their cruise missile or whatever the post office where all the employment records of the whole country were were kept and the psugo system <coughs> gone then we have parallel uh, parallel privatization that is in uh, lithuania something kind of similar of the uh, opt out system in uh, in england maybe one has heard but that's a peculiarity no? let's not enter and then mixed that means that part of the part of your contributions are simply diverted into the into the mm, public uh, into the private uh, pillar right uh, mixed in bulgaria in croatia in estonia where there's also a top up in hungary which was then reversed and reversed at first and nullified and nullified recently then uh, latvia one of the first reformers as well uh, macedonia imagine uh, what is that a two million country one million and a half country having two pension funds great competition huh? and poland which is one of the few markets uh, uh, where this can thrive Romania, where it stalled, and Slovakia, where it has been, uh, where uh, there has been a regression, and which has now a system which is again similar to Lithuania, so similar to an opt-out system. You can choose between whether to stay in the public or uh, go back or go into the private. And then those countries, which uh, some are very amusing, such as Slovenia, for uh, scholars that actually rejected World Bank's advices and opted for simply voluntary. Pensions. And here we're talking about uh, Albania, the Czech Republic, Slovenia, which has, however, a quasi-mandatory private pillar for public employees, and uh, Serbia. Bosnia and Herzegovina has not, of course, but it also has one of those, the most, one of the most amazing pension systems in the world, which is an automatic stabilization. So if there are funds to cover pensions, they pay them. So they can put it simply. If there are no funds to put to do that they don't pay them so that's the one of the harshest uh, ways of dealing with the problem the coverage the, they all played on a generational cleavage because there are certain acquired rights that of course you cannot simply uh, you cannot simply uh, deal with like that and and some could there could be some resist two things on the one hand there is objectively economic reasons not to include all the generations because there is not enough time to accumulate these funds to get something out of them okay therefore there was an upper limit that's the third line so it was not available to older employees apart from hungary where they are always special and there were many active mistakes that means that two old people has a, have actually entered the system and reneged on uh, a substantial chunk of their benefits in the public system. Huge problem at the very beginning. It was, uh, of course, mandatory for younger workers. Uh, for example, in Poland, under 30, in, Hung in, in Croatia, under 40. In Hungary, for their peculiarity, only for new employed is mandatory. And then there is a small chunk of people 
where uh, this uh, affiliation was voluntary. So between 30 and 50 in Poland, between 40 and 50 in, in Croatia. And we can see that rationally, the younger, uh, younger portions of these cohorts have op opted in, older, no. The size, interestingly, uh, most of these funds are quite big. Uh, so those are um, so so-called uh, pillar-specific contribution rates over tot the total contribution rate. Okay, in Hungary from six to eight percent. In in uh, in uh, Latvia from two to ten. In Poland seven point three out of nineteen. Slovakia nine and so on. Uh, so we have that all Central and Eastern Europe has either adopted a substantially huge, so a huge uh, uh, private pillar uh, diverting a lot of money into these funded pensions, or a medium one. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, there are also examples of uh, small pillars, small private uh, pillars, uh, that is like the Swedish one, which is just 2.5% of uh, the gross wage. Uh, however, of course, if we divert a lot of money, then uh, we have also big uh, transition costs. Not only they were big from the outset, from the calculations, but some grew bigger with time because they had... Uh, underestimated the number of people that would actually join these pillars. These pillars were extremely, because of the, let's say, anti-state ethos that was, uh, uh, that was pervasive in, the, in some of the propagandas for, this, uh, for joining these pillars. So we have some that a disproportional number of people actually joined, which makes uh, the problem of transition costs worse in central, in, in certain countries. I, I, highlighted in, in uh, red, more or less, uh, those countries uh, such as Hungary, Poland, La and uh, Estonia, where it got a little bit out of control. So it's well above 1% of GDP per year, uh, um, substantially worsening the uh, total budget balance for each of these countries. So uh, now, part three, the financial crisis. So let's, now it's 12 to 10 to 12 years later, what happened to uh, these uh, pension systems? The financial crisis um, didn't actually say, but the financial crisis, so uh, higher unemployment and, and falling out and so on, has of course uh, major repercussions on both funded pensions and pay-as-you-go systems. Funded pensions because there were dramatic losses on the stock market, and this depends on how exposed these uh, funds were to equity. So we have from very conservative ones, like uh, uh, Germans and Italians, they lost practically nothing, to those which were really hardcore uh, equity uh, exposed, like Ireland, which in 2008 lost 35% of the whole of the uh, of the assets value, uh, Poland, just to give an example, had a, a real loss of 14.8 uh, percent in 2008. Uh, so this is what, and in the pay as you go, so in the public system, instead the crisis goes a little bit more indirectly. It's the crisis on Main Street and not on Wall Street. Is that a number of people stop contributing because they lose their jobs, and therefore the, there is an imbalance between contributors and beneficiaries. And that's the main thing that happens uh, in public pillars, okay? So what, happened, what happens in uh, Eastern Europe with the crisis? Apart from Poland, most of Central and Eastern Europe are small and open economies, so between uh, populations between half a million, more or less, to 10 millions, right? I mean, these are open, small, and very much uh, dependent on the demand for their products, uh, so from on their exports, right? So, as we know, credit crunch, most banks became illiquid uh, in late 2008, also in the region, and there was a dramatic fall in international orders just following that. And this triggered uh, basically a, s a collapse in the production of this, of most of these countries, that is roughly a uh, five, six, seven percent fall in uh, GDP in 2009. You can see down there. And then we had those uh, special champions like uh, Lithuania, Latvia and Hungary, which not only had this uh, big exposure, but also had asset bubbles. So how proper, I mean, proper American style housing market, too many mortgages and too many loans being given to the private sector and 
and for some reason they were mostly foreign currency denominated. So when their currencies, which no, none of these was in the euro, their currencies started to started to decline, the whole thing just got bust, and we have s and we've seen something as dramatic as 15 percent, 18 percent in Latvia and uh, and Lithuania falls. I mean, these are kind of great depression falls types of falls. Okay, so the financial crisis hit this. Uh, the, the region extremely hard for these two reasons, okay? Now, if that were not enough, <laughs> European rules uh, made, made it worse, okay? Probably you know what, uh, how, what is the stability and growth pact, but in any case, since 1993, we're talking, these are all new member states or qu candidates to become parts of the European Union and so on. So since 1993, the Copenhagen criteria for accession, right, it's the key, nothing but the key, all well, something like that, all the key. Okay, so the key communitaire being the legislative body of the European uh, Union, the 120,000 pages of legislation, among which, and no one can opt out, as they could in the in the past, is future membership to the, of the Economic and Monetary Union, and therefore of the euro at a certain point. And therefore, also because membership has certain advantages, such as stabilization and so on, one has to obey the so-called Maastricht criteria, which I probably you all know, but I'll just quickly go through them. So inflation, which is uh, 1.5 percentage points higher than the average of the three uh, lowest uh, inflation member states, a budget deficit inferior than 3% uh, of GDP, government debt inferior than 60%, GDP, long-term interest rate, two percentage points higher than the lowest three. And this, uh, uh, the, 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 the precursor, let's say, of the Economic and Monetary Union, so an exchange rate mechanism joined for at least two years without devaluing your, uh, your currency. Okay? Among these, uh, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, of course, uh, um, once you join the Economic and Monetary Union, has been basically uh, introduced in order to avoid exactly what has happened. So uh, to avoid free riding. So free riding, that means excessive, for example, fiscal spending or excessive budget imbalances so that you can spend as much as you want but still benefit from a low interest rate, uh, which, is, uh, which is backed by all the rest of EU your members. So the stability and growth Pact from 1996 actually introduced the enhanced monitoring procedures so that countries should uh, fly down, let's say. Substantial sanctions through the excessive deficit, uh, excessive deficit, excessive deficit procedures. And, and this, they thought, well, it, it could work. Of course, when in 2003, both France and Germany starting to actually free ride on the Stability and Growth Pact, for whatever reason, but that's important only that actually they breached the 3% of GDP rule quite substantially. Then in 2005 came a renegotiation and increased flexibility of this pact. However, we're not that much interested in the Stability and Growth Pact as such, but rather in the impact on pension systems. So the problem is that if we have these rules in place, the ideal of any rule that is divided, or any regulatory uh, uh, thing is, or such as the Stability and Growth Pact, it's that it has a neutral impact on what kind of reform is being pursued by a single member state. So a CSGP should not encourage or discourage any type, any particular economic system, as well as a, pe so a pension system should be taken into consideration. So the problem was that all these people paying the trans substantial transition costs were actually in a worse position than those who did not introduce a systemic pension reform because they were, it was much more difficult for them to uh, actually uh, comply with the master criteria. So what in 2004, little history of this, when Eurostat actually ruled that mandatory, because it was a novelty basically uh, in Europe that came with the new member states, it ruled that the mandatory funded pensions are actually part of the private sector, okay? And not some quasi public or something where the accumulation of the funds, 
the accumulation of that debt that is in those funds could be actually uh, detracted from the whole uh, debt to GDP ratio or the whole deficit to GDP ratio. So, in this case, after this uh, uh, statistical, let's say, clarification by Eurostat, all the new member states were in big trouble. Uh, having we have already a deficit, and then now we have we are also penalized because we did this super cool uh, pension reform, right? No, so at the time the European when the euro crisis was still when euro the eurozone was still the the, the best and the brightest around, uh, they uh, so uh, the the um, the Commission proposed and the Council then also adopted the fact that uh, pensions will have some sort of, uh, um, let's say, um, privileged treatment here. So it was that uh, um, in order to adapt the fiscal policy of a certain country to the front loading of deficits, so to this higher deficit, there would be, and excluding these uh, funds from actually calculations and not uh, of debt, they would introduce a five year transition period where there would be a digression, so each year less and less of this transition cost will be deducted from the entire deficit. No? So, and, and these countries were pretty happy. No? I say, okay, we have this 1% of GDP that is going away, but still we are complying with the master criteria. But this was just for five years, okay, between 2005 and 2009. Now, of course, the country started to complain like crazy when this period, first of all, the expiry of the transition period in 2009 coincided with extreme budget deficits across the whole region due to the crisis. So they always started complaining, ah, now we don't have even the discount on our systemic pension reforms. Okay? Secondly, they said, well, but a second pillar matures in 40, 50 years. It's impossible that you give us a transition period which is only five years long. No, they should give us something much longer. And, and finally, they said the point that I made before, that reformers, systemic reformers should not be penalized. So, with respect to the non-reformers. So, there has been a demand, the famous uh, letter of eight Central Eastern European countries and Sweden to, uh, to the, uh, to the um, Commissioner for uh, Economic and Monetary Affairs, so to, to all UN at the time, so now, to actually either change the statistical treatment of private pension funds and get them back statistically into the public domain, okay, on the one hand, or deduct fully the costs of implementation of these uh, systemic reforms from the budget deficit with respect to an excessive deficit procedure. Okay? And now the European drama, the European inconsistency started. First, all events said, yes, this is justified, but no, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, take this into consideration. That was the first letter. Then Poland appealed. Then they said, well, yeah, maybe we can take this into consideration. Then now they are discussing that they might actually take into consideration. So I don't know exactly what is the state of play at the moment, but they have draft rules say that, yes, for the virtuous countries, of course, not for those that are in doldrums, which is logical. No, for the virtuous countries, we can make an exception. No, for the others, no. We'll see what happens with that. However, the crisis plus this uh, inconsistency at the European level triggered a whole series of reforms and reverses. First of all, it triggered temporary measures, which are extremely harmful to current pensioners. So the freeze of indexation of all but minimum benefits. Again, like at in the beginning of the 90s, I can imagine this poor elderly that think that they, they, they just uh, went through the collapse of socialism again, right? And uh, which during 2010 and 2012, and almost no country was exempted from this kind of uh, treatment. Then the positive effect was that many countries that postponed reforms, I mean, a pension reforms is something that takes a lot of political capital, right? So they postponed and postponed reforms, but then they finally had garnered enough political capital to actually introduce some parametric reforms. So, uh, I don't know, <sighs> Hungary did under the socialist governments, uh, the, mm, Poland did also, they, they managed finally to, to uh, increase retirement age. 
the re early retirement venues has, have been basically stopped in a number of countries. Then regular indexation has been lowered in a number of countries. So, so these, the usual things that should have been done 20 years ago have been actually enacted, to, and this was the positive crisis. However, on the other hand, since Europe did not actually come forward with some sensible proposal to deal with the situation, of course, governments prefer in this, in, under these circumstances to spend their excess money, if there's any, on Keynesian measures to, uh, to uh, let's say, spur the ex economies rather than just squander them for transition costs. So what happened is the following. Basically, the reversal of privatization in all of Central and Eastern Europe. And here we are going from some things, some cosmetic thing. It's not cosmetic. I mean, it was an amazing uh, mud slinging in Poland for almost a year. Uh, but it is relatively cosmetic. It's uh, a temporary reduction in contribution rates. Hopefully, they will go back at a certain point. Uh, and to uh, proper uh, to proper uh, renationalization of pension funds. You probably followed, maybe someone followed what happened in Hungary. I mean, Hungary is now famous for all sorts of misdemeanors. Uh, but this one was one that really, really, really made Moody's and Standard & Poor's absolutely mad, which was uh, diverting all of the contributions to the, of the, to the, pri of the private pillar back into the state coffers. First by freezing contributions, that was late 2010, and then by creating a, let's call it, an offer you cannot refuse to, uh, to the members of the private pension funds by telling them, well, if you stay in there, you can stay, but you lose all of your public benefits. So 97% of the 3 million members actually migrate, migrated back into the public sphere. So this is the end of the third part. I uh, can say that uh, for some, uh, some, there is a discussion now going on whether it is bad design of these policies or inadequacy of the financial markets here or the crisis. We don't know yet. It's a bit of a... But this uh, experimentation, experimentation with private pension funds, at least a la, a la World Bank style, is basically dead in Eastern Europe. Yeah. 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 These are all. Yeah. What basically what changed between before and after? I think. Uh, uh, shall we go to the some question session or because the, the fourth part is a bit of some political science uh, something that can be skipped, uh, I guess. <laughs> so I mean, if you like the if you like this is the story of the privatization in the region. Uh, if you're happy about this, we can talk about this. No, it has. It has. I mean. Dismissing the financial lobby and dismissing the government as uh, uh, extremely interesting in deepening the financial market is just plain stupid. I mean, it happened. So that was one of one of the uh, the triggers of reforms. Uh, there was that's, but that's the that's also an interesting part. I mean, you know, that's an, a different story that can be told here, which is why was this actually done? So why? deepening and how it was deepened and uh, interestingly the creation of uh, institutional investors such as uh, private pension funds in Eastern Europe has been actually used for protectionist measures as a protectionist measure and not as a liberal. Sometimes we say ah they are out liberalizing uh, Western Europe and so on, flat tax rate, I mean flat tax rates are usually put together with the privatization pension fund. There's nothing as opposed to this, as these two uh, these two ideas. Private pension funds were there in certain countries, uh, Poland, for example, it's a primary example, because also because it has the largest of or the most functional stock exchange, I think the second largest derivatives market actually in Europe, after London, um, is that, I'll, I'll give the example of Poland and then I'll give you the example of Croatia. Uh, they uh, actually issued quantitative limits on the portfolio investment of these funds. One of the quantitative limits, and that's the important one, is that there's a 5% limit on foreign, on foreign uh, 
stocks, uh, so foreign equity and so on. That means that 95% of these contributions have to be actually uh, invested at home, right? And this, how best to keep actually uh, your, uh, the, the family jewels, so the, all these enterprises and so on, what is uh, institutional investment to keep them in Polish hands instead of, uh, instead of, uh, uh, instead of giving them away or, uh, or is so having your money being channeled into the Polish economy as such. No? So I think that that's actually played a, a major, major role. In other, in other circumstances, um, for example, in the circumstances where, but this is interesting, for example, a Croatia, no? um, they definitely didn't have the money to do the, uh, this reform. It, was, uh, it would have been too costly, and uh, uh, the they have diverted a 5% contribution rate to the, uh, to, the private, uh, to the private pillar, right? So what did they do? They did exactly the opposite. They did a minimum, again, through quantitative limits to the portfolio investment, they did a minimum investment, that Bulgaria as well. I mean, they do all the same trick, basically. A minimum investment limit of 50% into government bonds. Yeah. So where does that money go? It goes just simply back into government. So here the motivation is different. It's not so much to, okay, to deepen the, uh, the capital market as well. In this case, it's proper freeing of social security contributions from earmarking, right? You get, you get bonds, you get money that is freely disposable. So freely, you can spend it on anything and you don't have to spend it on, 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 on stupid pensions anymore. And do your pet investments and whatever you want. So, I mean, I think the motivations are various. What I can say for sure with respect to, uh, to the facts is that there were only two markets, only Romania and Poland that were big enough for this to be a sensible policy. And this is something that the World Bank admitted. Although all of these countries wanted to, to deepen some, to, to create this kind of institutional investment. I mean, where did, where did we end up? We ended with oligopolization, we ended with price fixing, we ended with herd behavior, herding behavior, and in the end, in all of these countries, the fees of this, no self-regulation self never took off, all these countries had have had to cap the fees of these uh, of these uh, of these funds, and one of the basic tenets that is increased competition among funds has simply not happened in in this uh, in this uh, thing. Now, if if we can conceive this as a favor to the financial lobby, well, that uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be mm, so sure. I mean. Yeah, so um, if we look at it, uh, the, the European Union never really cared about uh, what kind of system, uh, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of system. The World Bank had, I mean, the, this was the World Bank's hobby horse at a certain point. I mean, it steered so much controversy in the 90s uh, and so on. Robert Holtzman and the whole, and the whole uh, series of people, there were defections inside the World Bank, outside the World Bank, and so on. So the World Bank was the one that was advocating this thing, and it deployed a whole range uh, of uh, of uh, ways of uh, for uh, um, let's say taming or domesticating this uh, so domestic actors and and kind of trying to um, sweeten the bitter pill, let's say, and helping financial ministers and so on. The 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 one real opponent was the ILO. The EU has played a relatively, uh, a relatively uh, meager role uh, for a whole series of reasons. The first reason, I think, is that there is such a multiplicity of uh, pension systems in the EU that no consultant, I mean, no two consultants can actually agree on one single, I mean, and this is not confined to pensions. This is basically, this was one of the big problems with the enlargement to this country. Second enlargement, as you perfectly probably know, it has been a work in progress during the 90s, where when the World Bank was actually uh, having a proper foot in the door in, uh, to the domestic politics in these countries, the European Union was still, uh, I mean, what are we going to have? Accession partnerships? No, this, that, I mean, regatta approaches, uh, I mean, whole series of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 
of uh, things. And finally, what, what the various regular reports and, uh, and the opinions, when they touch upon pensions, they simply say, OK, privatization is fine, as long as you are able to keep these transition costs under control. Voila. Ecco. That's the, that's the end result to the, to the story. <laughs> so, I mean, I, 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 I know quite well the cases of Poland and Hungary. And these are probably the two polars, uh, so they're poles apart. Put it. Uh, in Hungary, and this was the fourth part of the presentation that I wanted to, that you didn't see, but I wanted to show. So, there is, uh, so in Hungary we have a clear domestic struggle behind this. Um, we could blame uh, we could blame uh, um, either the institutional setting of the country or the mm, uh, party competition that is going on there and so on. But we know that in uh, 1998, when this reform, uh, when the Hungarian reform was enacted, the Socialist Party at the time under Gyula Horn basically did not consult Fidesz, that is the alliance of not so young anymore Democrats, um, who is now uh, becoming a semi-authoritarian regime, uh, to the extent that even its uh, allied partner, the um, SDS, that is the alliance of free Democrats, actually voted against parts of the reform. But the socialists did actually have a um, uh, super majority at the time in, in parliament. Okay, So this undermined definitely the resilience of the reform to future political shocks, in the sense that Fidesz never, from the very moment in which uh, it stepped into parliament, never, uh, uh, never tried to uh, to uh, uh, cover its disagreement, its uh, the fact that it despised this privatization for a whole series of reasons, that doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. It had a long-term plan, Orban had a long-term plan, which started in 1998, to actually get rid of this, okay? And uh, it actually did, in 2001. I mean, uh, that's not, uh, not very much publicized, but in 2001, this system had become a voluntary system just because of him. And he basically finished the job. Now, this was the perfect occasion, and it was 10% of GDP of disposable money, which was there up for grabs to, uh, to use for whatever petty projects he had, like to the flat tax rates and, uh, and their megalomaniac uh, investment projects and so on and so forth, right? Poland is exactly the opposite. In Poland, first of all, we don't have uh, we don't have um, such an adversarial pe uh, political system. There's uh, way more checks and balances. There is no manufactured ma majorities. Actually, the, pe the, the political system is extremely fragmented, usually. Uh, something like nine out of 18. Eight. First of all, there were 18 governments already or something. Nine of them were totally ungovernable and so on, right? Uh, but uh, therefore, reforms in Poland, I mean, comprehensive reforms, as this one, which was quite, uh, quite professional, called security through diversity, are extremely rare. Are extremely rare endeavors and have to have a whole series of factors coming in at the same time. And at that time, it was the creation of a depoliticized plenipotentiary of pension reforms, which was staffed with uh, advisors from different political factions. And the reform itself has been legislated not by one, but by two governments of completely different ideological standing. So this reform was widely shared among most of the factions there in, uh, in Poland. And in fact, as opposed to the Hungarian one, there, is basically, there has been basically no reverses. There has been some little ones until the financial crisis. And the current government, so, mm, the current government, which is the f by the way the first government that uh, wins a second, the second government that goes through a term, and the first government that wins a second term in Polish history after, after 1989, uh, has uh, was adamantly in favor of the private pillar, 
Also because the private pillar in Poland did not uh, did not uh, did recover basically the, 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 the in 2009 it was already back on top. I mean, had the spectacular losses in 2008, but in 2009, this unleashed an amazing an amazing uh, controversy between uh, more liberals. So between, let's say, the ultra liberal faction Balcerowicz and his. Uh, form on the one hand for example the uh, the normal conservatives let's say center right like civic platforms so donald tusk and his own ministers and then of course the ones who uh, were now pushing for a more voluntary approach reneging on their uh, and this probably for political opportunism reneging on their on their former uh, former ideas that is basically solidarność which was uh, now, for the first time, campaigning against this pillar. The struggle was extremely protracted, and finally, after I don't know how many drafts, led to, led to this thing here. So, um, I don't know if this, uh, this sort of reasoning that it is uh, a combination of uh, institutional capacity on behalf of the government, and a combination of the ideological standing of different parties involved that can actually explain also the other cases. But these two cases, I mean, the fact that Poland has had only a reduction and a temporary one, and the, which was extremely contested, and that it took them almost a year to get to this decision, and Hungary, which has snapped and destroyed the second pillar, these two can be explained through uh, the actual inception, political inception of the reforms and the path-dependent mechanism that led then to the destruction of the reforms themselves. I hope this kind of uh, elucidates a bit. But I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think um, one should then really do the process tracing of what ha happened in each of these countries because, okay, we have a common denominator, which is uh, the, the, the crisis plus the stability and growth pact, but of course, uh, each of these countries have had a, a, a very different uh, political story behind, uh, behind the reform. No, that is actually a criticism of the World Bank towards itself. So the World Bank actually ma made a mea culpa uh, in, uh, increasingly so, especially in 2009. The main, uh, the main uh, uh, let's say, criticism, it's not so much the regulation as such or so but that a pension reform, which has been uh, for a long time uh, deemed to be a, a matter of, uh, um, let's say, design. So which benefits go where, how we paying, how this, how that, no. It is a tile of a much larger puzzle. And this puzzle has to be uh, put together at the same time. Uh, and therefore, if we don't tackle the labor market, so increase of uh, people contributing and uh, uh, active labor market policies, uh, activation of the elderly, and so on. On the one hand, and if we don't uh, introduce proper regulation to financial markets, which do not have the preconditions, so these are not deep financial markets, they, are, they don't know how to deal with, uh, they don't have judiciaries which are, which, are, which are good enough to deal with financial fraud, with, with embezzlement, with all this stuff. I mean, not doing this and not doing the labor market is the main mistake of the World Bank. It's not so much the regulation. Regulation would have probably uh, reduced the strains, right? Reduced the impact, the negative impacts, but it would definitely not have solved the problem. The problem could have maybe solved if uh, the reforms were systemic and encompassing, at least in those two domains as well. Thanks for coming. Thanks for... Uh